Shalom and welcome to the Middle East Report. In this program today, we'll be discussing the 100th anniversary of the San Remo Conference that paved the way for the Jewish state. Well, welcome to the program. And uh, today's special guest is all the way from North Wales. Uh, he's a good friend of mine, Roy Thurley. Uh, Roy, welcome back to the Middle East Report. Thank you very much, Simon. It's really good to be here and very good to see you again. Pleasure. Uh, and Roy, I have to mention to our viewers as well that you are, you are one of my very special guests because uh, you married myself and my wife uh, back in North Wales back in 2011. So you, you have a very special place in, in both my heart and also my wife's heart as well. Yeah, well, it's, uh, it's, it's good to catch up with you just to make sure that you're looking after her and she's looking after you. Absolutely, definitely. So uh, moving on, we're here today to discuss the 100th anniversary of the San Remo Conference in which it's been termed San Remo 100. But before we kind of start and talk about this historical significance for the nation of Israel and the Jewish people. Um, can you share with us uh, your involvement in, um, in Israel-related ministries? Because you were, you, know, you were the former director of Christian Friends of Israel. You have um, been involved in a Kesha course that helps Christians understand their, the Jewish roots of their faith. You were also um, massively involved with one of the key people involved in Balfour 100 and setting up that incredible event at uh, the Royal Albert Hall to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the Balfour Declaration. Uh, and now you've got a new passion to um, talk about the significance of San Marino 100. How and when did the Lord really put a tremendous love and passion in your heart for Israel and the Jewish people? Okay, it started in 1976, which I know sounds like ancient history to a young man like you. I was two, I was two at the time. But in 1976, <laughs> my wife and I went to Israel for the first time. Uh, we went because we wanted to go to Israel. It was a Christian pilgrimage tour, um, and we'd heard about it, so we went. It was a two-week tour, and we visited a whole load of sites throughout the land, including in places which you can't really visit anymore because they're off limits because of the peace process which I know sounds strange, but that's the truth of the matter. But when I came away and I got back to the UK, I thought, OK, I've done two weeks in Israel, but I've missed something. And I don't know what I've missed, which is incredibly frustrating to know that there's something more, but not knowing what the thing more is. And it was some years later that I went along to hear this, this chap called David Paulson. And he was preaching at the time on it is time for the church to repay its debt to the Jewish people. And he, he hawked the sermon, if I can use that expression, uh, around the country. And I heard him in a church in Wimbledon, which is near where we lived. And it suddenly dawned on me, and this may sound absolutely ridiculous, I went to Israel and I missed the Jews. Now, how can you do that? And when I looked back, I realized we had stayed in Arab hotels with Arab staff, we had an Arab driver for the bus. We had an Arab guide. We had visited Christian sites only. We hardly saw or interacted with any Jewish people. And that was what the tour was about. That was a great tour, thoroughly enjoyed it. But, and, and we went to loads of Christian sites, brilliant. But what we actually missed was the Jews. So we went to Israel and missed the Jews. And his um, sermon, that, which I listened to, suddenly hit me. But that is what we had missed. We had missed the Jews. So at that point, I started looking into, if you like, the Jewish history of Israel, which would seem to be obvious. But it, it hadn't been until that point. And it was from then that I started getting involved with Israel-related ministry. Fabulous. Uh, and why is the issue of, of Israel so important to God? And why is it so important as Christians that we advocate Israel's cause and stand up for the Jewish people, particularly at this current time where we're seeing unprecedented rise of, of Jew hatred across the world? Okay, well, um, 
It's God's plan for world redemption is centered around the nation of Israel. So right the way from the beginning, after the, you know, after the fall, um, God had to put in place a plan for world redemption, his plan. It centered at that point on a man, Abraham. But from him, Abraham was promised seed, nation, land, and it's all surround, all that is to do with Israel. So the Israel people, Jewish people, they are as a result of God's promise to Abraham. The land they have is as a result of God's promise to Abraham. And of course, the seed, which was uh, Jesus, was seed of Abraham. So the whole issue to do with God's plan of world redemption centers around Israel. Now, when Jesus cried out on the cross, it is finished, what was he talking about? Was, does that mean that his total mission in life has come to an end? No. He had dealt with the, the problem of sin, which was necessary for all of us. But there is more to come, which is why he is still there in heaven interceding and waiting, if you like, to come back at the right moment for the complete redemption of the world. So the redemption of the world hinges upon Israel. Israel being back in its land, the people back in the land as promised to Abraham. And when that happens, and it is happening, then the time is ripe for the turn, return of Jesus. So with that um, excellent theological overview of, of the entire Bible there, Roy, um, why is it so important that, that then Christians make a difference and take Israel to their heart and, and stand up for Israel and the Jewish people? Because, you know, sadly we see very few churches willing to stand with Israel and the Jewish people or even talk about God's plan of redemption for Israel and the Jewish people. And we know the times that we're living in are biblical times because we have seen the fulfillment of God's word, which means these are troubling, but also exciting times. They are indeed troubling and exciting, yes. Um, I mean, there is an amazing amount of um, a lack of understanding. I nearly called, said ignorance, but I think that's being a bit unkind. Uh, but within the Christian church about the importance of Israel to our salvation and the salvation of the world. And I think think that comes down to an overemphasis, if you like, on the New Testament and a lack of understanding of the Old, partly because it's called the Old Testament, uh, which I, I don't like that term at all. Um, but that's, that's what it's called, and that's what most Bibles say, Old Testament, New Testament. I may even put a piece of blank paper in between to divide the two. And they also cut off the book of Revelation. They don't like going to that book either. Well, that's also true, yeah. Uh, but, you know, if, if we see the whole thing, whole, the whole Bible as being one story, and we start there in what is usually called the Old Testament, the Tanakh, then we can see the importance of Israel today as well. So if we go back 100 years, and uh, we have the Sam Remo conference, um, which formalised the international legitimacy for the future Jewish state or the modern state of Israel. Um, how important is the Sam Remo conference in terms of Israel's history, modern history, but also in terms of fulfilment of biblical prophecy as well? Okay, I think we need to go back a step and say, why did the Sam Remo conference happen? Um, so we need to go back to the fact that this happened shortly after the First World War. Now, up until 1917, the land, which we now call Israel, was part of the Ottoman Empire, and it had been so for 400 years. The Ottoman Empire is basically Islamic, so within the land of Israel, that was the culture at the time. Now, the Ottoman Empire crumbled during the First World War. So at the end of the First World War, the, the winners, if you like, had to decide what to do with the spoils of war. And the winners, principal allied powers, they met together uh, in a peace conference in Paris in 1919 to decide, OK, the war is over. What do we do with all these territories? Now, at the Paris Peace Conference, they dealt with the European side of that, because obviously the war, Germany, Austria, you know, that kind of area, all those territories, what do we do about those territories? But they didn't have time at that conference to deal with the Ottoman Empire. So the San Remo Conference came a year later 
to effectively complete the work that the Paris Peace Conference had started and dealt with the Ottoman Empire. What do we do with all those territories? And out of that came states that we now recognize today, like Iraq, then called Mesopotamia, Lebanon, Syria, and um, the other main area that came out of it in terms of the mandate system, which I'll mention in a minute, was, was Palestine. But also that came out of that were independent states that came out of that, that were part of the Ottoman, Ottoman Empire, already ready for independence. So what happened was that those states became independent, but there were states that were not far enough developed to have independence. So they introduced the mandate system, which meant that one of the principal allied powers would be put in charge of that country in order to bring it to the point where it could govern itself. And those were the countries that I've just mentioned. So France was put in charge of Lebanon, Syria. Britain was put in charge of Mesopotamia or Iraq and Palestine. So we were given that mandate for the whole area of Palestine, which actually was an undefined area in its geography at that stage. It was just, you know, there, there weren't any boundaries to it, but it included the historical land which we would know as Israel from Bible times and included in that. And the Balfour Declaration, of course, had said that within that area, Britain's interest was to establish a homeland for the Jewish people. So that Balfour Declaration was then incorporated into the mandate for Palestine agreed at San Remo. So it's very significant that it then became not just a letter of intent by one man, an important man, Lord Balfour, Foreign Secretary at the time, but it became part of international law as a result of the San Remo Conference. So let's have a look at this uh, excellent news report put together by uh, Chris Mitchell from CBN that looks at the significance of the San Remo Conference that took place 100 years ago. Former Israeli President Haim Weizmann said, this picturesque town on the Mediterranean played a crucial role in Israel's modern history. He said that it's not an exaggeration to say that, uh, that the Jewish state uh, was born in San Remo. Following the defeat of the Ottoman Empire in World War I, leaders of the Allied powers met in San Remo. Their goal? A new Middle East. While most of the land went to the Arab people, the Jewish people received back their ancient homeland. What happened here in San Remo in 1920 transformed the Middle East, and for the first time in nearly 2,000 years, the nations of the world recognized a Jewish homeland. What is very important to understand is that long before that, long before the Holocaust, there was already an agreement that the Jewish people had uh, a right to statehood, they had a right to self-determination, just like any other uh, uh, people groups. 2014 marks the 94th anniversary of the San Remo Resolution. Israel also recognizes San Remo as a present-day foundation in its battle for a place among the nations. Since there is an effort today to question our legitimacy, we have to go back to San Remo and say, look, here is the uh, international document uh, agreed by all members of the League of Nations at the time that says that, yes, we have this right. And that right provides historical ammunition to fight the boycott, divestment and sanctions movement called BDS. It aims to persuade companies and countries to withdraw money and investments from Israel. It counters the arguments of the BDS movement to say that, you know, Israel is a colonial power. It is the opposite. Uh, many um, historians would say that the San Remo uh, resolution also was the beginning of the decolonization process because uh, here we have a people group that uh, have been occupied for 1,800 years about that are finally getting their recognition of statehood. Sandel adds anyone questioning the modern state of Israel can find the answer in this Italian connection. When we today have this whole question of do the Jewish people really belong in Israel, do they have a legitimate claim to the land, that question was uh, decided once and for all in 1920 under international law 
here at this very place, San Remo. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, San Remo, Italy. And uh, such a, a significant place, San Rio, that actually saw the implementation of the Balfour Declaration that became Israel's legally binding right to exist as a modern state. Mm. Uh, and that, that is really the implementation of the, uh, the, of the Balfour Declaration. So can you uh, um, remind our, our viewers again, I know that, uh, uh, was it three years ago, we, we did a whole series of programmes, I did a whole series of programmes looking at the Balfour Declaration, the importance of the Balfour Declaration, but how did this one declaration that was signed by Lord Balfour himself, the Foreign Secretary, um, then endorsed by Lord George, the Prime Minister, in his cabinet, so it became a matter of British foreign policy, um, become, became implemented within the San Remo conference by the Allied powers who met there to discuss what should happen to the Middle East after the First World War. Okay, well, um, you know, as I said, the San Remo conference was basically a follow-on from Paris. Um, the First World War initially was with, you know, between what we call the Allies and Germany and, the, you know, as, as the leader of the opposition, if you like, uh, in, in that war. And so that's where it started. But, of course, Turkey joined in on, uh, on Germany's side. So that's where the Ottoman Empire gets included in to the mix afterwards as what do we do with this land. So um, when the Allied, principal Allied powers gathered together at San Remo, and when I say principal Allied powers, this was uh, Lloyd George was there representing Britain, and also obviously the French Prime Minister, Alexandre Mitterrand, the uh, Italian Prime Minister, Francesco Nitti, and also the Japanese ambassador, with a representative from uh, the USA. He wasn't part of it. He was there only as a representative because the USA never actually declared war on Turkey, whereas the others had. So he was there as an observer. But those principal nations then had to decide, what do we do? Because the, in a sense, the, the land was in, under their control now as a result of the First World War. So they had to decide, what do we do with all that land? And so that is where Britain's desire to see a Jewish homeland in Palestine, which had been written down you know, three years previously, in the, or two and a half years previously in the Balfour Declaration, that was where that was on the table as now we can actually implement it. And of course, Britain had captured the area. It was their troops, British allied troops that had come in. I say British because it was not just Britain. In fact, it, Anzac troops were involved as well. But, you know, I, I still, it still puts tingles down my spine when I realise that the Balfour Declaration was agreed by the British cabinet on the 31st of October. 1917, on exactly the same day, at more or less exactly the same hour, British and Anzac troops captured Beersheba, the first place in Palestine to fall to the Allies. Now, th there's only one person I know that could organise that. It has to be God involved. Absolutely. So let's have a look now at an extract from an excellent film uh, produced by Hugh Kitson called Whose Land? And in this section of the documentary, they look at the importance and significance of Sam Remo Conference. In 1917, Lord Allenby conquered the Holy Land and the Jews were promised a national home in Palestine by the Earl of Balfour, a policy endorsed by Woodrow Wilson and by the League of Nations, which made Palestine a British mandate. San Remo, the Villa de Vachon. This is the place where legal rights were granted. This is the place where legal rights were given to both the Jewish people and the Arab people. Dr. Jacques Gauthier is an international human rights lawyer. For more than 30 years, his focus has been the legal status of the old city of Jerusalem under international law, which was the subject of his doctoral thesis. He describes the significance of the decisions made at the San Remo Conference in April 1920. It's in this place that the leaders with the power to make binding dispositions 
with respect to the Ottoman territories, deliberated and made the decision, having heard claims from the Zionist organization in Paris in 1919 during the Paris Peace Conference, having heard submissions from the Arab delegation in respect to what they wanted in the Ottoman territories, having heard these submissions, a group of them gathered here and made final binding decisions in international law as to who would get what. What mandates did, what the whole institution of mandates was about, was a way of guaranteeing self-determination of peoples. It was really the first time that international law created and recognized this, this right. It was the Jewish people that were chosen to be the beneficiaries of a trust, a mandate under the care of the British government in respect to Palestine. It was the Arab inhabitants of the territories of Mesopotamia, Iraq now, Syria and Lebanon that were chosen to be the beneficiaries of a trust or a mandate. Part of it under the trusteeship of or mandate of the French, Syria and Lebanon, part of it under British supervision, Mesopotamia. The Supreme Council of the principal allied and associated powers that met here at the Villa Devashan in April 1920 was made up of five nations, Great Britain, France, Italy, Japan, and the United States, which as an associated power was present as an observer. The British delegation was led by Prime Minister David Lloyd George. San Remo, from the legal point of view, is the major link between the Balfour Declaration of 1917, which was a, a promise, uh, but it wasn't a legal commitment, it wasn't a legal document, it's a, a vital historic document, but San Remo turned it into an international commitment. The difference is that these powers now can give rights to others. They do have the power of disposition. They receive it in treaties, such as the Treaty of Sèvres of August 1920, and later the Treaty of Lausanne of 1923. In these treaties, they are specifically granted title. So it is vital to understand that this power of disposition that was required in international law to be able to grant rights, it is obtained by these five powers and then conveyed subsequently to the Jewish people and to the Arabs. During the, the San Remo Conference, as the representatives of the powers are trying to de determine the scope of the territory to be covered by the mandate for Palestine, the scope of the territory to be the location of the national home of the Jewish people, the question is asked, what should Palestine be? Lord George refers to a specific map from uh, a famous geographer, an expert in the Middle East, in Palestine, George Adam Smith, refers to map 34, which is a map which depicts the kingdoms of David and Solomon, areas on the west side of the Jordan River, east side of the Jordan River. He then explains to the French representative, Milleran, that we must give the territories from Dan to Beersheba to the Jewish people if we are going to recognize properly their claim to a, the historical connection with the Jewish people. Also, you find a multitude of communities, of villages, of cities in the area that we would describe today as the West Bank or the disputed territories the recognition was given that there was a connection between the Jews and these communities. It's also very interesting to note that if we look at the map, of course, at the center of it is Jerusalem. And that is just a small section of this uh, excellent uh, documentary produced by Hughes Kitson, whose film so you can watch and get the whole entire 
documentary. I have to, to ask you, Roy, um, particularly after we, we, we saw the uh, excellent extract of uh, Whose Land, um, is the fact that what was the motivation of the British? Because, you know, we had to look at Britain as it was 100 years ago. It was a world superpower. Mm -hmm. It had an empire. Uh, why was the mandate of Palestine, as it were, so important to the British Empire? I think in all these things there are always mixed motives. But I want to start with the, the biblical side, the Christian side. It is quite interesting that the British war cabinet that, that agreed the, the Balfour Declaration was virtually all Christian. Uh, there, was, there was 10 men involved and eight of those were known to be Christians of various different flavours, if you like, and, and commitment levels. But nevertheless, the background to them all was biblical. And they recognised that um, the land that they were looking at, the land of Palestine, was the land that the Bible describes as the land of Israel. And, and they recognised also that the Jewish people needed to be restored to their homeland. Why? Because the Bible says they will be. So there was certainly a strong biblical connection within the, within the cabinet which is wonderful to know that you know, we had a kind of a Christian cabinet at the time. Uh, so, so that was there behind it. But alongside that, there were also a lot of political considerations as well. And one of those was the, the situation in Egypt because the canal, the, uh, the, the Suez Canal, was extremely important to British commerce. We had... Um, obviously India as part of our empire at the time, India and Pakistan as it now is. And um, if we wanted to trade with India, if, if the canal wasn't there under our control, if you like, we had to go way around South Africa to get there. And that would be a, a hugely long journey, a more dangerous journey, so therefore expensive. So we wanted to make sure that the Suez Canal was under our control in some way or another. And of course, Palestine is very close to that. And it meant that if Palestine was something that the British were responsible for, um, and Egypt was going to be an independent uh, kingdom, fine, but they were on our side, that it would make sure that we had our trade routes open to the rest of the empire. Also, when it, when it comes down to uh, the, the, the actual mandate, what is the mandate, the British mandate, because, uh, you know, it was the San Marino Conference that gave the British the right to have the mandate of, of Palestine, which included, as you mentioned earlier, uh, modern-day Iraq, uh, Jordan and modern-day Israel, and uh, that the French received the mandate for Syria and Lebanon to prepare them for statehood. So mm -hmm. what, what did the actual mandate involved and what was the British government's responsibility in terms of the mandate uh, and what was its end goal? Okay, as it were. Uh, just to clear up, we actually we were awarded two mandates, one for Mesopotamia, Iraq, the other one was for Palestine, uh, which includes Jordan. So the, the mandate was there recognising that with the mandate for Palestine was quite different from the others actually because mainly the mandates were there to encourage the indigenous people to come to a point where they could then form their own independent state. The mandate for Palestine was different because it was for the Jewish people. And at that time in history, the vast majority of the Jews were not living in the area of Palestine. They were living in Europe, they were living in America, they were living all over the world, but most of them weren't there. But they, it was recognised that this was um, a huge group of people who were stateless and that they should have a state of their own. So they should be back in the land which was theirs thousands of years ago, particularly with the kingdom of David and Solomon. So the, uh, the idea of the mandate was that the the mandatory, which is Britain in this case, was there to bring about the institutions of government to encourage immigration into the land by Jewish people so that after a period of time, they would come to the point where they were sufficiently well developed that the Jewish people could take over running their own land, effectively becoming an independent state. So that was the goal of the mandate 
to become, for the Jewish people in their land, to become an independent state. And it was Britain's job to bring that about. Uh, and why did Britain fail in its responsibilities to uh, facilitate um, uh, the uh, re-establishment of the modern state of Israel? There were two reasons. Uh, t to me, there were two main reasons why it didn't work out as well as it should. And they are the Jews and the Arabs. <laughs> so first of all, um, I think it was expected at the time that once the um, mandate came into force, so 1920 or legally, if you like, 1922, um, once that came into force, the expectation was that large numbers of Jewish people particularly wealthy Jewish people, would want to go and live in the Promised Land. And therefore, they would be able to not just add numbers, but add value, if you like, to the area. They would be on the entrepreneurs that would set up the businesses. They would be people who were used to running corporations or, or government or whatever uh, that could be brought in. And that didn't happen. The number of Jewish people immigrating to the land in the early days of the mandate was relatively small and they weren't the movers and shakers, if you like, which the British government hoped would come in. So that's the first thing. But the other side is that the Arab side refused to accept any Jewish state in the area. So there was opposition to what the, the, the opposition to the Balfour Declaration, there was opposition to what the uh, San Remo Conference came up with from the Arabs right the way from the very beginning. They did not want to see that happening. They wanted that land for themselves as an Arab territory completely, the whole of Palestine. This was before Palestine was partitioned into two parts because that happened in, in Egypt, um, 1921, I think it was, it was shortly after the San Remo Conference and with the, the, the famous, you know, Winston Churchill drew a, a line down, a green line between the two and said, that's going to be Arab, this is going to be Jewish. I think that's rather more Hollywood than reality, but, but you know what I mean? He, he actually partitioned um, the land at that point into an Arab section, which was... Um, then called Transjordan, because it was the other side of the River Jordan, and the original part of Palestine, the Jewish part of Palestine, which was to become a Jewish homeland. So that's everything west of the Jordan, from the river to the sea, as we might say today. But, but how does that um, add up, essentially, with the close friendship with Chaim Weizmann, who was then the leader of the Zionist movement that was uh, the political representation, uh, the political representative of establishing the modern state of Israel and his friendship with Chaim, uh, sorry, his friendship with uh, King Faisal, um, because the two cooperated together. They had discussions at the Paris Peace Conference in, in 1919, and it was King Faisal who said that, I will endorse your support for a Jewish state if you help give the Arabs their own independence. So when did that relationship break down between King Faisal and, and the Zionists? I'm, I'm not sure that the actual relationship broke down. I think it was broken, if you see what I mean, externally, by what Britain did. Um, yes, you're absolutely right. They got together and they agreed a partition of the land of Palestine between the Jews and the Arabs, and they agreed where that demarcation line should be, which was on the east bank of the River Jordan, uh, close to what was actually a major railway line that ran north to south down through Jordan, um, which was a main railway line for taking pilgrims to uh, Saudi Arabia, to Mecca, for the Hajj. So th that was put into Arab territory. Everything west of that, give or take, was to be um, the Jewish part. That was in recognition of the fact that in biblical times, Israel's occupancy was not just west of the Jordan, but there were the two and a half tribes that re re resided east of the Jordan, right away from the time of Moses. So it was regarded as by the, the Jewish people as being part of land of Israel. Now, 
Chaim Weizmann was never interested in anything beyond that to the east. He didn't want the whole of Palestine as had been defined. He never expected that, but he was looking to have land to the east of the River Jordan. That didn't happen because Churchill decided that the border would be the river. Why? Because a river actually is far more defensible than an arbitrary line drawn in the sand somewhere near a railway line. Gotcha. So therefore, if, if, the, if the river is the border between the Jewish side and the Arab side, then that is much more easy for the Jewish people and the British in that land to defend. But he also put in place on the eastern side a friend of Britain that he could lean on. You know, that was the, became the kingdom of, of, of Jordan later on. So he put in a, a friend there so that he could lean on if there, were, if there was going to be trouble between Arabs on the east side and Arabs on the west side. And similarly, he had friends in the south, Egypt, so to try and stop infiltrations coming from there. So he was trying to make sure that the Jewish side of, of Palestine, west of the River Jordan, was as secure as possible from the Arabs intervening, because he knew that what he was doing was anathema to the Arabs. So let's see uh, the second part of uh, Whose Land, uh, talking about the significance of the San Remo Conference as we celebrate its 100th anniversary. The San Remo Resolution of April 1920 was later unanimously endorsed by all 51 countries of the League of Nations. It was a watershed moment in the history of the Jewish people who had been exiled from their national home for almost 2,000 years. Referring to the San Remo Resolution, Chaim Weizmann, who would later become the first president of Israel, told the Zionist annual conference in July 1920, that recognition of our rights in Palestine is embodied in the treaty with Turkey and has become part of international law. This is the most momentous political event in the whole history of our movement. And it is perhaps no exaggeration to say in the whole history of our people since the exile. The Zionist Organization of America had a similar reaction. The Zionist Organization of America um, similarly declared that the decision of the Supreme Council of the principal allied powers, in other words, the San Remo decision, crowned the British Declaration, which is, of course, the Balfour Declaration, by enacting it as part of the law of nations of the world. Some contend that uh, the intent of the Balfour Declaration, the intent of uh, the decisions of the Allies in San Remo, and then as, as reflected in the provisions of the Mandate for Palestine, merely meant that a national home would be established in a small component of what was Palestine. This makes no sense. When you look at the discussions between Lloyd George and the other representatives of, of France and Italy on April 25, and I have the minutes to support this, it's clear that the intent is to give what was on the map, discussed during the meeting, to the Jewish people for their national home. The Jewish national home was a term, a euphemism that the Zionists themselves used to mean a Jewish state. The British were under no illusion uh, that, it, uh, that it meant something else. They knew it meant a Jewish state. This is what uh, Lord Arthur James Balfour himself said when he approved the Balfour Declaration at a cabinet meeting on October 31st, 1917. The late Howard Grief began practicing law in 1966. For many years, even before that, he had an interest in Middle East affairs. In the 1980s, he began to examine long hidden documents in the British National Archives that minuted the San Remo Conference of 1920. As a result, he published the book, The Legal Foundation and Borders of Israel Under International Law. He also discovered exactly what was the eventual projected outcome for the Jewish national home in the Balfour Declaration. During the cabinet session of October 31st, 
Balfour himself said that eventually, uh, if the Jews take advantage of the possibility that they're given and, be, and uh, come into Palestine in sufficient numbers, they will have a, their own Jewish state. Uh, this was also approved by the Prime Minister, David Orr George. Minute 12 of the War Cabinet meeting of the 31st of October 1917 records Lord Balfour's intentions as follows. As to the meaning of the words national home, to which the Zionists attach so much importance, he understood it to mean that some sort of British, American or other protectorate under which full facilities would be given to the Jews to work out their own salvation and to build up by means of education, agriculture and industry, a real centre of national culture and focus of national life. It did not necessarily involve the early establishment of an independent Jewish state, which was a matter of gradual development in accordance with the ordinary laws of political evolution. So there was no doubt that when the Balfour Declaration was issued, it meant a Jewish state. However, the idea that the possibility of the Jewish national home becoming a Jewish state was later denied by the British government. And uh, this is why it's so uh, significant and so important that we understand what happened 100 years ago to realize that the San Remo conference gave legitimacy to Israel as a modern state. Uh, and this is one I draw upon, upon now, really, uh, with you, Roy, is um, what role did Lloyd George uh, play um, in terms of pushing forward for the creation of the modern state of Israel? Because clearly this is an issue that he believed in. He believed that the Jewish people should have their own state and their own homeland. So how much was his own kind of personal faith, his own biblical background and his understandings of his role and responsibilities to facilitate that play a major role with the decisions that were made at San Remo. Lloyd George was steeped in the Bible right away from childhood. He was brought up, I mean, he was a first language Welsh speaker and he was brought up within the Welsh language church and the Welsh language church was um, very much Bible Based, so he was. It, it was in, it was put into his life from a childhood, uh, which, which was which was great. Um, so he understood the significance of Israel, and he was able to. He, he was, I believe, placed, put in that place by God in order to to implement God's plan at that particular moment in time. He was crucial to seeing that happen. Um, <laughs> There's always some question mark because he'd, his lifestyle did not betray the fact that he was particularly Christian, if I can just use that expression. But nevertheless, he had a strong biblical focus in his background and he knew that the Jewish people had to be back in their land. And, and how was the um, Sam Remo conference received by the leader of the Zionist movement, um, Chaim Wiseman, who was also a delegate of the conference, uh, and also the Jewish community worldwide with the announcement of the Sam Remo uh, Declaration? OK, well, the Balfour Declaration itself, before it was given, was discussed between Britain and America. So the Americans were well aware of what the Balfour Declaration was going to contain in the sense of it, you know, the Jewish homeland in that land. And they were very happy with that. So the, the Zionists who were involved in that discussion as well, so Chaim Weizmann, um, they obviously were very, very happy with that. When it came to the San Remo Conference itself, as you say, uh, Chaim Weizmann was there. He had previously had discussions with King Faisal uh, because the, the Arabs were obviously interested also in the land of Palestine. And the two of them had come to an agreement as to you know, where the boundary between the two should go. So the, the Jewish people were very... In, involved in this, they were very pleased with what was going to happen and they were looking forward to the implementation of the Balfour Declaration in the mandate for Palestine. Despite that, physically, they didn't respond in the way that was expected. So looking back a um, hundred years on since the uh, San Remo conference, why is it so relevant and important to Israel? 
for the Jewish community worldwide, but also for Christian supporters of Israel. The, the mandate for Palestine gave Britain the responsibility of bringing about a Jewish homeland in that area of land. So the whole aim of it was that the Jewish people would be able to run their own affairs in due course. That has happened. The mandate, if you like, has not been terminated. It has been fulfilled. So it was fulfilled by the Jewish state coming into being in May 1948. It wasn't terminated. Britain terminated its uh, responsibility for the mandate in 1947, but it, the mandate itself had a life of its own, if you like, and that was fulfilled by the Jewish people themselves declaring independence. So the legal validity of Israel rests not on the Resolution 181 of 1947 in the United Nations, it rests on the San Remo Conference of 1920. That is their legal foundation. And within the, that mandate, it says, for example, that nobody can take that away from them unless the, the Jewish people agree. So that is the, the mandate. And the land that is referred to in that obviously includes everywhere from the river to the sea in, in that area now. In other words, that the Jewish people have entitlement to sovereignty over not just what is the current state of Israel, but also the Gaza Strip and what is usually known as the West Bank, which biblically is known as Judea and Samaria. So they have legal title over all that, and that has never been offered up for grabs by the Jewish people. Therefore, it is theirs. So in terms of those uh, uh, Israel haters who say that Israel has no right to exist, Israel has no international legitimacy as a state, we, we see that that is complete lies when we examine what actually took place at the San Remo conference 100 years ago. Absolutely right. Um, the, it seems to me, in looking at the way that the, the media and everything treat Israel, as though history began in 1967, and when those wicked Jews invaded the land next to them, which was known as the West Bank at the time. And that's when history starts, according to, to what we normally see. And they do not look at the back history, which shows that that land only became part of, of Jordan when Jordan invaded that land in 1948, immediately after the establishment of the State of Israel. And international law says that you cannot acquire land in an aggressive war. It's illegal. So they had an illegal occupancy of West Bank for those 19 years, between 1948 and 1967. That is ignored today. But that is where you need to go back to. And then you need to go back further than 1948. So where did it come from? Sam Ramo is the answer. Excellent. Um, and also there is a major event being organised to remember the 100th anniversary of the Sam Remo conference. And this is going to take place at the, um, uh, the Emmanuel Christian Centre in central London on Saturday the 18th of April. So do you want to tell us about this conference that you're involved in, uh, in with uh, Love Never Fails and the Alliance of Pro-Israel Christian Organisations to remember that historical event that took place 100 years ago? Yeah, well, we, we see this as being an incredibly important event. Um, you know, we, we, we were great in celebrating Balfour 100, uh, you know, two and a half years ago, but that was just a letter. Now this becomes international law. So it's extremely important that we should remember this publicly as Christians. And we've got a nice team of people there to look at this. Clifford Hill is going to be uh, setting the historical context. Uh, we've got an international lawyer coming along, Andrew Tucker, who's going to be looking at the legal aspects. Uh, we've got a... a somebody who we call a mandate survivor. In other words, a, a, a man who was uh, in the mandate period, an Israeli man who is coming across from Israel specifically to tell his experience. I think he was on the Exodus 1947 ship. He's going to be interviewed as part of it as well. And, um, you know, we, we, we are also going to look at Gentile people who were helpful 
to Israel during the mandate period uh, as well with, with another speaker. So there's a whole thing, a lot we're going to look at uh, to do with the, with, the, with the mandate period. Some of it's good news, some of it's bad news. Um, so we, we need to recognize both in that, that uh, you know, the Christian community are coming together to give thanks for what was good and to express sorrow for what was bad. But yeah, it's brilliant and uh, you need to book up your tickets. And how can they do that? They can go online and uh, the, the tickets are available at www.lnf.org.uk slash tickets. And if you look at that, then you will be able to book up tickets for the event on the 18th of April. Uh, and finally, how do you think uh, Israel will be remembering the Sam Remo uh, conference that took place 100 years ago? Well, we know that the Israeli ambassador to Italy is actively involved in the commemorations that are going to happen in San Remo. And the San Remo municipality is very much involved with that as well. And they are extremely enthusiastic about getting world leaders to come along to mark the event over the following weekend from when we're doing it. They'll be there over the weekend, 24th to 26th of April in San Remo to commemorate that event because they see it as being hugely significant, which it is. Excellent. Uh, Roy, I just want to thank you so much for being my guest on today's Middle East Report to explain to us the historical and spiritual significance of the San Remo conference uh, that took place 100 years ago that paved the way for the modern state of Israel. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Just want to thank you all for watching today's Middle East Report as we look back over the last 100 years to the San Remo conference uh, that took place that allowed the re-establishment of the modern state of Israel and gave Israel her international legal legitimacy in the eyes of the world. And that's why it's important that we all remember and we remember that our nation, Great Britain, played a huge part in helping to re-establish the modern state of Israel in fulfillment of biblical prophecy. So what other song could I leave you with um, apart from the Hatikva, the Israeli national anthem, as we remember what happened at San Remo 100 years ago?